This is the audience. There we go. Um, as he introduced me, I do, in fact, work in the toy industry. Um, I work for one of the biggest toy companies in the world. We're called Spin Master. And sorry, she's saying slow down, but I only have five minutes, so I got to speak fast. Um, one of the biggest toy companies in the world. And uh, I'm actually the guy who finds the new products that we make. So I go around and I, I, I meet with toy inventors. Like every toy you've ever played with likely came from an independent toy inventor who had this creative vision to make some little plaything that connects with an audience. And I'm the guy who's sort of lucky enough to go around and meet with all these people and look at the toys and play with them. And um, Spin Master is what you call a mass company. We sell millions of toys to millions of kids. And, and what I'm really looking to do is every year to find that the must-have toy. This is like the big time toy that everyone's talking about at Christmas time. It's a toy that has that real something special that you know gets the buzz going. And it's not really that different from, say, a pop star who's trying to break through. And um, you know, actually, before I go forward, is there a clicker thingy for the uh, the PowerPoint that I should have on the on the podium? Green button. Hmm. This. Ah, oh, there we go. Great. Um, where was I? Sorry. Um, it's not that different. Finding that, like, the must-have toy is not that different than a pop star looking to hit a new big song or a movie company that's trying to sell a big blockbuster movie or even a politician that's like, looking to win support for his new idea. At the core of it, what we're all doing is we're trying to connect with the world in a meaningful way with something that's new and, ex uh, new and exciting. And in the last 10 years, I have seen uh, about 25,000 toy presentations. 25,000 individual toys have been presented to me. And um, you know, each one is made by an inventor with the intention of entertaining and delighting. And you know, most of them, unfortunately, don't. You know, they're OK. They're not that cool. They're not that fun. But once in a while, a toy comes across that just has sheer magic. And, and you know, in, my, in my experience of showing toys to people as I bring them into the company, I've had the chance to see people interact with thousands and thousands of toys. And I've tried to sort of figure out what is this quality that makes the ordinary extraordinary? And you know, I don't have a secret formula to picking toys, and I don't have a crystal ball, and I've, I've been wrong you know, slightly less than I've been right, but still enough times. And I, I've tried to sort of think about what that thing is that we're looking for. And it's that little thing that you haven't seen before, that little bit of extraordinary surprise, um, that thing that fulfills your inner drive and makes you want to touch it and try it and pick it up and experience it. Um, and uh, in short, you know, it, it's the thing that makes a, an apathetic person in the world who has a million forms of entertainment sit up and take notice of this thing, even if they didn't want to in the first place. And at the core of it, really what it is, it's magic. We're looking for a little bit of magic. And over the years, I've tried to figure out what's sort of the recipe for this magic? What are the qualities? And this is where I'm going to get a little bit esoteric, and I'm going to digress. I'm going to try and do it quickly. Because I'm going to talk about this man. And this is a guy by the name of Arthur Kessler. And he's an author, um, you know, philosopher, political scientist. And he wrote a book in 1964 called The Act of Creation. And in this, in this book, he tries to dissect what makes a joke funny. You know, he has a thing called the logic of laughter. And, and in, this, in this chapter, he's trying to break down what are the elements that makes laughter, this powerful, overwhelming sensation that you can't resist when it hits you, what are the elements that make it happen? And he introduces a concept called thought matrices, matrices of thought. Okay? And what he's saying is that every time you approach something in life, you automatically build a thought matrix that helps you interpret what you're seeing. If you remember from math class, a matrix is basically just a, you know, I have actually a picture of one is a set of values, a set of potential outcomes. So for example, you see a lion approach an antelope. The lion could attack the antelope and kill it. The antelope could run away. Maybe the lion decides to back off. But you can sort of get a sense of what the expectations um, are. Um, in it, sorry, it's the, the likely expectations are going to be. Um, he gives an example. So if you approach this in life, you look at it, it's an abstract shape. It could be, represent a taxi cab to you. It could represent an Italian tablecloth. It could be a checkerboard. Um, you don't really have a lot of things to constrain your thought. But if I show you this, now all of a sudden you see a very codified set of rules. And, and you have a very different set of expectations. If there's a bishop on it, you see something crisscrossing. If you see a rook on it, you're going to see a very rigid form of, 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 of lines. And this is how we approach everything in life, pretty much, with these, with these matrices of thought. And what he says is that when you tell a joke to someone, what you're doing is you're lulling them into a particular matrix of thought, a particular way of thinking. A particular set of outcomes. You're telling them a setup that's going to build a scenario that leads them to a certain number of expectations. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a punchline. And this punchline doesn't fit in the matrix. The punchline is something you totally didn't expect. It's totally outside of your, your expected predicted outcomes. But amazingly, it still fits the logic of the original setup. And what it does is it forces you to think in a different way all of a sudden and change the outlook that you had 
to incorporate this new information into your, into your thought matrix. It basically has forced you to change the way you think instantly and intellectually in a very powerful way that, that provokes an actual physical reaction, laughter. So what's the point of this, you might be asking? I mean, why is this toy guy um, talking about jokes and the logic of laughter? And that's because this, this, this level, this, um, this um, I read this in, in college, and it stuck with me over the years, because as I've seen people interact with toys, I've realized that it's basically the same thing. If I can bring something to you, and I can have it um, defy your expectations, if I can have it do something that you didn't expect, if I, I can, if I can provoke a reaction that you didn't see coming, that's where the magic starts to happen. But beyond that, there's a further constraint to this. Because I can make something surprise you, that's not hard. If I show you a car and it transforms into a duck, it's surprising, but it's really not that cool. It's a little bit weird. But if I show you a car and it transforms into a cool robot, it kind of makes sense. You know, you saw the pieces of the car and now they make the pieces of the robot, and that's magical. That's where people get excited. If I show you a laser gun and it starts playing show tunes, it's really not going to be, it's a little weird. But if I show you a laser gun, you have a bunch of expectations of what this gun's going to do. You can point it to something, pull the trigger, and if it provides some magical, powerful explosion that you didn't see coming, that's where the magic happens. And this is a core message in product development and marketing. And it's what marketers call the bridge to familiarity. This is, this is the, the, the delicate balance between innovation. And what's innovation? It's something new. It's something that you haven't seen before, but also the familiar. And it's in this fine line between novelty, innovation, and the familiar, that's where the magic happens. And that's where creativity happens, and that's where messages that resonate with people happen. So the way that a joke works, yeah, two, 30 seconds longer. The way that a joke works is very much the same way that a pop star works when she's communicating your message, which is the same way that a toy works, and it's the same way that a political message or even a revolutionary thought works. So that's the connection between toys and everything else. Thank you very much. <laughs>